I've been around a lot of brides who've been planning their wedding since they were little girls. And planning for a wedding and planning for a marriage are two very different things. So when y'all were girls, did you dream about what your wedding would be like and the wedding that you planned when you became an adult or a young adult? Was it anything like what you dreamed? I dreamt about mine all the time. I mean, I did too. <laughs> <laughs> it was constant. I don't know how many different weddings I had planned throughout the years. And our wedding looked much different than I had ever thought it would. But, um, but it was perfect for exactly what God meant for us to have. I would say up front, Amanda and I have probably been in between the two of us almost 30 weddings before we got married, and that's yeah. not a joke. Um, so we have thrown showers and been bridesmaids and have all the dresses. So um, for me, I didn't mostly dream about it, I think, as a girl as much as when other people started to get married. And then I think it can kind of become comparative. Like, I want to do that, or I definitely don't want to do that, you know, so... That is kind of what shaped, I think, our wedding ceremony was seeing other people's mistakes mm -hmm. or failures or good things that yeah. they had had in their ceremony that I wanted to replicate. So, so what kind of failures have you seen in weddings? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> we, we were at one in uh, North Carolina. A friend of mine got married, and the bride comes down. To, it's a beautiful afternoon, and the preacher says, Dearly beloved, thank you so much for coming today and the joining of this man and this woman. If you'll kindly come to the basement as there's a tornado warning, we need to take shelter. So an hour and a half in the basement of the church, power went out, hail outside, um, which actually worked out well because back in the ceremony when things cleared, um, there was candlelight and uh, there was a rainbow over the church and it just ended up to be a great, a great day. It reminds me of the epic failure for me. I've used it as a joke, but it actually happened in a wedding ceremony that I officiated. I asked couples to give me the verses, and I'll print them out on a piece of paper and give it to their reader, because they ask you know, their cousin, their uncle, someone to read some passage at the wedding. And uh, this actually happened. They were to read 1 John 4, 16, which says, um, We have come to know and believe the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. And on it goes. And the problem is they left off the first and instead read John four sixteen, which says, Go call your husband and come here. The woman said, I have no husband, Jesus. <laughs> you said correctly you have no husband. You have had five husbands. <laughs> and the one you have is not your husband. It, this, literally, straight up, they read this passage in the wedding. Oh, that's awesome. It's probably one of the most epic failures of uh, any wedding that, that I've officiated. And, of course, the bride, they're going, Wah! and it was, it was pretty exciting afterwards. Um, the tragic part is probably the audience didn't even hear it. A small percentage did, but there were those, it was, it was just the Bible, and it was kind of noise, and people weren't paying attention. When we go to a wedding ceremony, some components happen. This declaration of intent we talked about before, that you're reenacting the God in the garden, fashioning a woman, and handing that woman over to Adam, and to become one. You're also enacting the leave and being joined together and becoming one flesh. Leave, cleave, become one flesh. And we illustrate that, of course, when the couple typically walks forward, they join hands, and then we exchange vows. And in, in the vow concept, we, there's a number of times in the Old Testament where a vow was in, in Malachi. We're talking about a, a covenant that went before God. In, in Hebrew, a covenant was to cut a covenant. And the idea, if you ever saw all Westerns, where um, the Indian and the white man would cut their hands and they would shake their hands and that blood covenant. What that meant in Hebrew was, um, if I don't keep my part of this covenant, you can kill me. If you don't keep your part, I can kill you. And a blood covenant was, we're making this covenant promise. So the covenant language comes in, in popular weddings a lot of times, they talk about a marriage covenant. And it's interesting, this is the one aspect of a wedding ceremony that always strikes me. God asks man to keep one covenant, marriage. He doesn't ask us to keep our salvation covenant. He doesn't ask us to keep a good works covenant. He doesn't ask us to fill in the blank. 
He says, keep this one covenant. Because God designed this whole thing. And at the end of that wedding, and I've officiated hundreds, I don't know how many, and I love the line at the end where I get to say, let me introduce to you for the very first time, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so. Because two, no longer, one, they have become. And it's a, it's a miraculous thing between God and these witnesses that you have taken a name. Your name just isn't your husband's last name. It's your identity in Christ. Two become one. And as through covenant, through the word of God, through the witnessing of God's people, something happens that's supernatural. And two people are joined together because God designed image bearers to become one because we're better as two people with differences and strengths and weaknesses than we are alone left to our own devices.